Secret Society of the Shamans, Introduction and Chapter 1. Secret Society of the Shamans was published in 1993, 23 years ago. And I was very, very proud of the, of the book because I'd been writing since I was, uh, let's see, I think it was 13 in 1969. I'd been writing before that, but I was, that's when I had my first work published and I've had hundreds of articles published. Uh, a series of um, <clears throat> almost a hundred uh, history booklets on Michigan that I <laughs> that I <laughs> they, uh, um, published myself and marketed uh, throughout the Great Lakes area, as well as some video cassette releases too. But when this book came along, I was I was absolutely delighted and excited. How it came about is I had written uh, an article, I think it was in 1989, for UFO Universe magazine, which was edited, edited by Timothy Green Beckley, a wonderful, truly wonderful person. And um, I guess he liked the article, and he uh, contacted me and asked me if I thought I could uh, to do a, a whole book on the subject. Well, the, the book... Uh, turned into being one about Native American religions, um, primarily in the Great Lakes region, although it does stray around a little bit to other areas uh, in the book. But I, uh, I remember at the time when I was um, getting ready to write it, I had an old uh, mammoth <laughs> manual typewriter with a war very worn ribbon, and uh, my mom and dad were wonderful people. I, they would have done anything for anyone that they could. And uh, mom came to me and asked me if I thought I could use a computer to, uh, to work on the book and uh, my other uh, project, writing projects. And I didn't know anything about computers back then. Um, so I said, geez, you know, that would be really nice. Thank you. And so um, myself, my mom, and, and uh, my wife, uh, got in the car and, and drove on down to Saginaw. I lived in Greenbush at the time and was working for the Elkona County Review, actually. And um, <clears throat> Mom let me pick out a computer. And they were pretty expensive back then. Um, the base, the monitor, one of those monolithically huge monitors, <laughs> and um, a dot matrix printer with the paper that uh, was perforated came to about $1,300. And uh, my folks weren't rich by any means, but they generously purchased it for me. Now, Timothy probably thought I was a nutcase because before I started working on the book, I asked him for an advance. And I don't know if that was something that he typically did or not, but uh, he sent me a couple hundred dollars and you know I bought supplies and stuff that I needed and started on the project. Um, once it got rolling, I had it done probably in about three months. And uh, sent it off to him, and uh, did a little bit of editing. He did, but not a whole lot. Uh, I got criticized by some people in my family for the uh, grammar. I'm not, I'm not good with grammar. I write the way I talk, and I think I communicate well. So he, Timothy, uh, liked it that way, and so he left it as I had written it. Well, when the book came out, I remember the day that uh, uh, he sent, Timothy sent me a box of probably, I think there's like 20, 25, maybe 30 copies of the book uh, that I could give out to family and friends or that I could take and, and sell if I wanted to and make a little bit of extra money. And I was kind of surprised at the price. It was fifteen ninety five, And uh, so I did. I gave them to a lot of people, but... Um, uh, the day the box came with the with the books, I I can still see uh, Dennis and Charlene, who I believe were my children at the time. They got they were so excited. They were small. They were little. Charlene was very young, and Dennis was only maybe seven. But when they saw the books in that box with Daddy's name on it, or who they believed was Daddy at the time, they. Uh, they, they were so excited and helping me open it up and taking them out and looking at them and and it was great and the whole process though was a lot of fun for me um, one of, probably one of the most exciting times in my life there were many, there were a lot of book signings <clears throat> um, and I enjoyed those and then there were quite a few radio interviews which were an awful lot of fun too and they were all over the country and there were a couple of television programs too. One was a half an hour program where the uh, interviewer 
uh, gave me, me the whole half hour and interviewed me about the book and uh, the re, you know the Native American religions. And uh, I'll never forget that. It was an exciting time. I'm not a celebrity, but I felt like one then. And uh, so anyways, I, the one thing I didn't care about with the book was that I didn't have a lot of pictures to send with the accompanying text. And so I was told not to worry about it, and Timothy uh, found images that he used in the text. Well, the images actually were from the Native American Indians of the West. And that really didn't apply to what, the, to what the text was. And I'm not faulting him because, again, he is a man of a very generous heart. But um, now that I'm recording this to present on my YouTube channel, I'm uh, going to do it without most of the original pictures and using images that would be more appropriate for the Great Lakes area. So having said all that, I am going to... Uh, Go ahead and I'm going to present to you chapter one of Secret Society of the Shamans. And the chapter is titled The Midewiwan Society of Secrets. It seems as though mankind stumbles across the mysteries of the ancients, usually quite by accident. My discovery of the Midewiwan or the Grand Medicine Society was on just such a note. My main interest in prehistory had been. For many years, the relics lying concealed beneath the mat of rotted leaves here in northeast Michigan. All that changed one hot, hot August afternoon as I made a couple of uh, very nice and unusual discoveries. For eight years, um, I have been digging at a site which is called Old Manhattan Creek. It is located in a wonderfully peaceful woodland setting about a half a mile from downtown Oscoda. This little green gem that it even exists, unspoiled by the, the ravages of encroaching civilization, is in itself a miracle. It is there uh, about a, a three block long piece of land, equally deep, bordering on the bank, banks of Annette Creek. To the north, having obliterated a good portion of this late woodland uh, occupation site, which means uh, that it was had as much as 1400 years old, anyways, is a large housing development, and the scenario to the south is the same. How long the great Manitus that these ancients worshipped will protect this little portal of time is yet to be seen. For all our sakes, I hope that it is forever. As you walk into this prehistoric village, you will find that the ground is on three levels, each reflecting higher water tables in the past. The highest level is the oldest, dating back over 2,000 years. I called this a portal of time, and sometimes I feel this is true. For the relics never seem to run out. Seldom do I ever enter this site that I don't come out with a bucket of pottery shards and many stone tools. In fact, from the small area that remains of Old Manhattan Creek, I have recovered the remains of over 1,400 prehistoric pottery vessels, a phenomenal number for an area of such a small size. When I say the remains of pottery vessels, I mean that I find the shards or pieces of them, but rarely ever complete pots. Of course, there is a good reason for this. Over a millennium of freezing and thawing cycles has smashed earthenware vessels into pieces. We are able to approximately date the site and tell how many vessels were present by the rim shards, which are quite distinctive from vessel to vessel. This particular day was quite stifling. The humidity made it seem as though we were breathing water. Merely walking on such a day is an effort, but some force had beckoned me led me to forget the discomforts of the flesh and conduct excavations. Walking into the woods, I heard the monotonous drone of what must have been a million mosquitoes. They generally bother me quite a bit when digging, but this day for some reason they kept their distance. Perhaps the hand of Gichi Minitu, the great spirit, was upon me, or maybe it was just too damned hot. We, I picked out a somewhat shaded spot, and with shovel in hand I penetrated into Mother Earth, and she gave not a wince at my intrusion. Gently, I made a circular cut in the black earth, and then, as if opening a doorway into another era and culture, I peeled the de decomposition, decomposition of centuries away. I gave a slight gasp, for laying there uh, before me were several uh, pottery shards, 17 in fact, small shards, and I could tell by the decoration that they were all from the same uh, vessel, so I carefully removed the shards and placed them in a baggie. 
in doing this, I fitted um, enough together to tell that most of the pot was there, making it the most complete vessel I had ever found. Later, I would wash it and reassemble what nature had torn asunder. When pieced together, I found that the pot was a child's vessel, about two inches tall and two inches across. It is bell-shaped and has a very nice incised geometric design. Also, it was about 90 to 95 percent complete. Had this been the only find that day, I would have been delighted, but the most unusual was yet to come. I was digging on the edge of a hearth, which is to say a campfire. This was attested to by the waxy black loam and the plethora of bones. And digging on down, uh, I found many charred bones. But I also found an artifact that would prove to be a link between my old Manhattan Creek site and possibly the Midday Wewan, a secret society of the Great Lake in Lakes Indians. I gave another gasp as I uncovered a palm-sized stone with a large hole in the center of it. The hole immediately made the stone suspect to me, and I thought first that it might have been a pendant or a gorget. This turned out to be the case. The stone was uh, covered with sand, and as I, I brushed that off, I became more excited, for here was not just a gorget but one with an incised design. The pendant has two faces. First, I'll describe what I consider to be the front. The pendant is of a lightweight stone and is tan colored. The hole appears to be a natural formation. However, it had been scraped out and enlarged. The scraping marks are quite apparent. The hole appears to be, uh, to be countersunk, being larger in, uh, in front and tapering towards the back, radiating, radiating out from the hole in a sort of starburst pattern, are incised lines. Half of these straight lines are circumvented by circular lines traveling through them. The back of the stone is just as unusual, though it has no incised design. The back is a little eerie looking, uh, very much resembles a human skull. The natural hole comes all the way through. Next to it is a second hole made with a stone drill. This gives the appearance of two eyes. Uh, there is another drilled hole where the mouth would be. The drilled holes do not go all the way through the piece. Given these holes and the general countenance of the stone, you would have a look very similar to a human skull. Well, I became obsessed with this particular find as it was so unusual. And the reason it was so unusual is that, yes, we find abstract designs incised into pottery, but <clears throat> never anything in stone. This was not just an abstract design either. This was a familiar design, and my task then was to track down where I had seen it before. I had seen the design in a book titled Indian Rock Paintings of the Great Lakes by Selwyn Dudeney and Kenneth E. Kidd, uh, published by the University of Toronto in 1973. In this book was a drawing of a birch bark scroll with pictographs on it. These scrolls were used by the Medewewan and are close, the closest thing uh, to native writing found uh, in the Great Lakes region. There upon the scroll was the same starburst design, just as I had remembered seeing it. Here was a connection between my village site and that ultra-secret Indian healing shaman society. I began a detailed investigation as best I could into the Mediwewan. My investigations gave me a unique insight into the people who lived at my late woodland Indian complex. Whereas archaeology only uncovers the cold scientific facts at a site, this connection brought with it a cornucopia of oral and written tradition that brought these villagers to life for me. The birch uh, scrolls are sacred indeed. Some that still exist are of great antiquity and cannot be deciphered. The information contained in these scrolls was revealed only to, us, to select Indians, and rarely did whites or Europeans get a glimpse of the midday. The six-foot scrolls were a combined textbook and prayer book that gave directions for initiation rites and other sacred rituals. The secret society, the Midewewan, is said to have been given to the Indians by Manabazo, also less familiarly called Wiskendajek. In the Anishinaabe or Chippewa religious tradition, Manabazo was second only to the great spirit Gichi Manitu. In the mythology of these ancient people, whose very name, Anishinaabe, means original man, Manabazo was a helper in the creation to Gichi Manitu. It was Manabazo who, in times past, was the great protector of the Anishinaabe people 
and who obtained the Midiwi one for their exclusive benefit. Now, until recent years, anthropologists, including Harold Hickson, placed the origin of the Midiwi one in the 17th century. We now know that this is erroneous, that in fact, through discoveries such as my inscribed uh, Gorget and the stone discs, uh, chapter 2, that it, its origins find their roots hundreds, perhaps thousands of years before the year, first Europeans came to America. It was during the 17th century onward that the true Midiwiwin became deluded with ideas brought uh, by the European mind. The Midi priests wore a uh, bonnet of many different feathers, so to speak. Through him was preserved the folk history and traditions of the tribe. By the use of birch bark scrolls, he also preserved the knowledge of medicinal plants that were used for healing the infirmities of his people. For him, and on rare occasion, her, the secret to long life and good health was to have a near spotless personal conduct, as well as having a good knowledge of the proper use of herbs and music. Herbs and music combined together merged in a, ma a magical metamorphosis, which amplified both of their healing properties. The Grand Medicine Society had its uh, restrictions that were placed upon the priest. In fact, in some ways, the Midiwiwin sounds much like the secret societies of today. For example, the Midiwiwin had a limited membership. It worked in a stepped uh, manner. That is to say, there were at least four different levels to be attained. Some sources claim there were as many as eight degrees. Each degree had to be attained in progression and necessitated mastering certain sacred knowledge, as well as in some cases, a hefty financial sacrifice. The first degree midi priest was required to possess the knowledge of a few common herbs and the music that made them work. These things were kept in, the, in his midi bag, not unlike a medicine bag. Higher degrees were taught uh, the great mysteries of the society, and according to uh, Jefferson Danziger, uh, who wrote Chippewas of, the, of Lake Superior, these higher ranks were taught the properties of the rare herbs and even the nature of vegetable poisons. Songs used in rituals, as well as other instructions, were recorded on the birch midi scrolls that had pictures engraved on them suggesting the ideas to be remembered through the generations. Regular meetings of the society are held in the spring and summer in a lodge called the Midiwigan. Only members were allowed in the Midiwigan, and before initiates could uh, be admitted, they had to fulfill a period of purification. An excellent description of the Midiwigan and the Midiwigan was written in 1852 by Warren. You must remember in this account that, <clears throat> that some of the uh, uh, prehistoric ways had been abandoned. As an example, Rather than furs being hung in the lodge, various types of cloth were hung. Warren wrote, I was once standing near the entrance of an Ojibwe Midiwigan, uh, more commonly known as the Grand Medicine Lodge, while the initiates and inmates were busy in the performance of the varied ceremonies of this, their chief medical and religious site. The lodge measured in length about 100 feet and 15 in width, was built partially covered along the sides with green boughs of balsam trees. On a pole raised horizontally above its whole length were hung pieces of cloth, calico, handkerchiefs, blankets, etc. The offerings or the sacrifices of the novice who was about to be initiated into the mysteries of the Midiwiwan society. The lodge was full of men and women who sat in a, a, lo, in a row along both sides. None but those who had been initiated were allowed to enter. They were dressed and painted in their best and most fancy clothing and colors and each held in his hand the Midiwiwon, uh, Midiwiwon, or medicine sack, which consisted of bird skins, stuffed otter, beaver, and snake skins. This account tells how the novice to be initiated sat in the center on a clean mat facing the Midiwiwon, Midiwatug, excuse me, which is a cedar post planted in the center of the lodge, painted red and decorated with tufts of bird down. Warren continues, the four grave-looking wikons, or initiating priests, stood around him with their medicine sacks, drums, and rattles. One of the four wikons, after addressing a few remarks to the novice in a low voice, took from him his medicine sack, um, the midimegis, which is a small white seashell, 
which is the chief emblem of the midi rite. Holding this on the palm of his hand, he ran slowly around the inside of the lodge, displaying it to the initiates, and followed by his uh, fellow Wakans, swinging their rattles and exclaiming in a deep guttural tone, Wee Wee Wen, circling the lodge in this impressive manner. On coming again to the novice, they stopped running, uttering <clears throat> a deep, sonorous, What Ho Ho Ho! They then quietly walked off, and taking their stand at the western end of the lodge, the leader still displaying the shell, the Midiwegis, on the palm of his hand, delivered a loud and spirited harangu. The language and the phrases used were so obscure to a common listener that it would be impossible to give a literal translation of the whole speech. The following passage, however, forcibly struck my attention. Warren again continued. While our forefathers were living on the great salt water towards the rising sun, the great Megis seashell showed itself above the surface of the great water, and the rays of the sun for a long period were reflected from its glossy back. It gave warmth and light to the Anish, uh, Anish Inabug, the red race. All at once it sank into the deep, and for a time it gave life to our forefathers and reflected back the rays of the sun. Again it disappeared from sight, and it rose not till it appeared to the eyes of the Anna Ish Anabug on the shores of the first great lake. Again it sank from sight, and death daily visited the wigwams of our forefathers till it showed its back and reflected the rays of the sun once more at Bowie Ting, which is Salt Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Here it remained for a long time, but once more, and for the last time, it disappeared. And the Anish in Abug was left in darkness and misery till it floated and once more showed its uh, bright back at Moaning Win A Kuingin, La Point Island, where it has ever since reflected back the rays of the sun and blessed our ancestors with life, light, and wisdom, and its rays reached the remotest villages of the widespread Ojibwas. During his entire discourse, the old Wicon continued to display the sacred shell, the object of their faith. Warren desired to obtain an explanation as to what the speech meant exactly, and so presenting the Wicon with a gift of tobacco and cloth for leggings, he persuaded him to reveal the meaning. The priest explained to him what the Mijas spoken of meant in the midday religion. He continued with a curious statement that in the beginning sounds as though he may have incorporated reincarnation into his system of beliefs. He said, Our forefathers, many string of lives ago, lived on the shores of the great salt water to the east. <clears throat> there seems to be some obscure meaning in the string of lives statement. The Wicon continued, Here it was that while congregated in a great town, and while they were suffering the ravages of sickness and death, the great spirit, the intercession of Manabazo, the great common uncle of the people, granted them this right wherewith life is restored and prolonged. Our forefathers moved from the shores of the great waters and proceeded westward, and the Midewewan Lodge was pulled down, and it was not again erected till our forefathers again took a stand on the shores of the great river near the uh, Mon where now Montreal now stands. In the course of time, this town was again deserted, and our forefathers still proceeded westward, lit not their fires till they reached the shores of Lake Huron, where again the rites of the Midewewan were practiced. Lake Huron, by the way, is less than a half a mile from Old Bennett Creek, where I found the midday stone gorge. Thunder Bay, where the disks of Chapter 2 were found, is part of Lake Huron. The priest continued to explain to Warren. Again, these rites were forgotten, and the Midiwewan Lodge was not built till the Ojibwes found themselves congregated at Bowie Ting, uh, the outlet of Lake Superior, where it remained for many winters and still the Ojibwe moved westward, and for the last time the Midiwilan Lodge was erected on the island of La Pointe, and here, long before the pale face appeared among them, it was practiced in its purest and most original form. Many of our fathers lived the full term of life granted to them by the Great Spirit, and the forms of many old people were mingled with each rising generation. This, my grandson, is the meaning of the words you did not understand. They have been repeated by us, our, and our forefathers for many, many generations. For every ceremony, a gas kitabag ban, or medicine skin, is given to the participants. Twelve different skins were used in the following order. Otter, mink, owl, snake, bear paw, grizzly claw, 
portion of the bear hide, the skin and feathers from the breast of a turkey and gray squirrel and a weasel. Those in attendance at the Midewewin Rite carry the medicine skin uh, um, he was given when he sponsored a ceremony. Being that there is no limit to how many times a member might go through such a ceremony, he may have had a favorite skin which he carried, or oftentimes it was the one used in the preceding ceremony. Early accounts tell that the skin and mejus were buried with individual members when they died, and archaeological excavations uh, bear this out. In historic times, though items meant to represent the skin and mejus are all that is buried. The reason being, the powerful forces behind the mejus may indeed cause the corpse to reanimate and live beyond the grave. Imagine, if you will, that this is true. <laughs> Zombie-like creatures spawned by the Great Lakes area Midewewin Society. <laughs> it has been claimed that uh, disinterments prove this to be a fact, at least among the Indians. If such is the case, perhaps some of the ancients still walk the mystical shores of Michigan, Michigan's Great Lakes. An interesting side note at this point concerns the Chippewa belief that the first Earth and its red inhabitants somehow made the great spirit Gichimanito so mad that he unleashed a flood on the face of the Earth to destroy his creation. Sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? Manabaso, who was discussed earlier, acted in as, as an immediate intermediate and saved the red race, allowing them to dwell safely on the earth. In fact, Manapasu taught them how to farm, how to hunt, and to cure the sick. He also gave them tobacco, which was of great significance socially and religiously to the American Indian nationwide. Manapasu was not without his faults, though. He was also a trickster, and his antics are found throughout the woodland tradition. Modern-day Midewewin rites have become homogenized, weakened by the influence of white missionary work. It is rumored that the pure rites are performed in secret and that the mixed-up rites are performed for the benefit of the curious. Um, the written accounts indicate that there is uh, also strong power in today's Midewewin and in the sacred Mejus. W. Vernon Kinnitz, in his book The Chippewa Village, describes a modern-day, about 1946, Midi healing rite. Mr. Kinnitz lived among the Chippewa at Lac Vaux Des Desert, 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 how do I say that? Des Desert, it looks like. But at any rate, sorry. He reported the following. As now, um, as now constituted, the Midewewin is a ceremony given by an individual either to gain health or to ensure its continuance. A sick person and his family is seldom able to arrange a ceremony during the illness, but is given the benefits according to the following ritual. When a person is sick and the other remedies fail, the shaman usually prescribes a session of the Midiwewin. If the patient or the family agrees to put on the right, the shaman fastens a mejus around the patient's neck, either threaded on rawhide um, or sewed in a flap or uh, of, such a, of uh, such a string. The power, health giving and otherwise, of the ceremony is symbolized by the mejus. The act of fastening on the mejus is called borrowing life. <clears throat> Wearing the mejus is a sign that one is living on borrowed time, as it were, and sooner or later must clear up the account by putting on the Midiwewin ceremony. Thus is supposed to be within a year, but sometimes goes two years or more. Conducting the old ceremony takes much preparation. Feasts have been given, and some alcoholic drink must be on hand. There have been <clears throat> there have been have to be gifts given and those who erect the poles for the lodge have to be paid. The day prior to the ceremony, the midi uh, wigan is made ready. Its, frame, uh, its framework is bare and unattended until a ceremony is called. Preparations consist of repairing this frame. The frame is made up of saplings which are pounded into the ground in two, in a, in two rows, 12 feet apart. These are then bent together in pairs. These poles form an arch about seven feet tall, and in appearance it's not unlike a longhouse inhabited by the Indians in pre prehistoric times. The entire building is much like an elongated dome. The ends of the lodge are made in fashion by, uh, by poles again being pounded into the ground in a half circle, and are then bent in and tied to the arches. The completed lodge is about 70 feet in length. Kenneth's told of of um, covering the framework with standing pieces of, of cedar bark against the outside of the framework and he explains that starting with the east doorway these slabs which were about five feet long 
and form uh, and from one to two feet in width are put in place with each slightly overlapping the previous one and fastened with saplings placed horizontally across the slabs and lashed to the inner framework. The cedar bark covers only the sides of the lodge. The top of the lodge is covered with bar uh, birch bark. The bark is cut three feet wide and sewn together to form rolls 15 to 20 feet long. One roll is laid lengthwise along each side of the lodge overlapping the top of the cedar bark slabs. The spaces between the two uh, sheets of birch are covered with a third. The entire ceremony, as far as is known, is quite lengthy. An auskabawis, or carrier, distributes the invitation to the midday ceremony. He begins with a dish of tobacco and small sticks in the amount of the number of persons to be invited. If the person contacted is going to attend, he signifies by taking a stick and also partaking of the tobacco. As already stated, music is a large part of the midday ceremony, and because of this, great care was taken in the preparation of the instruments to be used. The drum, as in most Indian religions, plays a highly significant uh, part in the ceremony. The drum used in the midday rites is 16 inches tall and 8 inches in diameter. It is made of ba uh, basswood or cedar. The drum is thicker at the bottom than at the top and has a wooden bottom and about halfway down the sides a small hole is made in which water can be poured. The hole is plugged up and a small wooden, with a small wooden peg. The drum, uh, the drum head is kept moist. Uh, there is virtually no decoration except for uh, a red circle in the center of the wooden bottom. The drumstick is also special. One end of the stick is carved in the effigy form of a bird's head. The stick is about 18 inches in length. A rattle is also used. In ancient times it was made from turtle shell, birch bark, or even a gourd. Birch bark, being sacred to the Chippewa, was probably the most widely used medium. <clears throat> w. Vernon Kinnitz is one of the few whites to actually witness the sacred ceremonies back in the 1940s. His descriptions are vivid, and I would like to quote just a little from uh, them about the ceremony itself. So, I do quote. Instructions in each degree of the Midewiwin is given the candidate orally by means of, of drawings in, in the sand. Beside the drawings, which do not amount to much, there are little wooden figures to represent the different gods, the Mide and the candidate. The principal instruction is by means of these figures. The actions of the dancers to the location of the presence, the seats of the gods, and the positions of the candidate himself at different stages of the ceremony are shown by means of these figures. I'll interrupt here the, my uh, quote of, of this narrative here only to ask a question that I cannot answer. What gods? Are there secret gods of the Chippewa that whites do not know about? <clears throat> we know that there are three principal gods, but Kenneth indicates in the following narrative that there may have been as many as 12 gods present during the midday ceremony. In trying to secure an answer to this for the book, I found that no Indian would discuss details of the Midewiwin with me, but this is pretty much what I expected. Now anyways, Kinnitz continues. As the conclusion of the ceremony, or at the conclusion of the ceremony, the sticks representing the gods are given to the candidates along with a pinch of sand uh, used and some of the tobacco passed at the dance. The sticks are kept by the candidates for a year and then placed at the foot of a tree or some other place <clears throat> with some <clears throat> excuse me, tobacco to ask favors or continuation of health. As far as I could find out, there was no special sand used, just wet sand. And it was pressed into a rectangle approximately 4 inches by 12 inches and about 2 inches in height. The wooden figures were about an inch and a half or to 2 inches in length and shaped like a carrot with a little ball on the large end. Kinnitz continued, There are 12 gods present at each meeting of the Midewiwin. The one outside of each door is its guardian. The one outside the east door has to be placated before entering the lodge. In the song sung before entering, the, the phrase, I am mentioned, occurs frequently. This is to tell the guardian of the door that the singer has been mentioned in the Modwigan, and so it is all right for him to enter. I was able to observe nothing in the ceremony that included the or participation of the four gods represented by the sides of the door. All six of the interior spots were included during the ceremony. In each round of the lodge, um, either by the midday or uh, his assistant alone, 
or when they headed the procession of dancers, each of these six spots had a rattle shaken once at, at, at very vigorously um, at it, and the drum also dipped towards it at the same time that it was given a sharp stroke. One of the Midiwiwin, or of the Midiwiwin, we can find the tangible remains of its existence through archaeologi archaeological means as I employed. There are also the myths handed down from many generations of Indians which speak of its origin. There are even a few accounts of white people who were allowed to observe the ceremonies. However, there is one thing you will not find, and that is any insight into the actual healing rituals performed by the midday priest. These remain secret and probably always will. I called the Michigan Tribal Center at Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and asked for information about the secret ceremonies. Just wanted to see what the response would be. The only response I could get is, we cannot talk about such things, they are sacred and to us alone. But the original rituals are concealed even from those descended of the great old ones who performed them in the now dim past of the Great Lakes area. In chapter one. I hope you'll join me again when uh, we take a look at chapter two, Mystery Religions of Northeast Michigan Woodlands, which will be coming up in a few days. Thanks for stopping by. God bless and have an awesome evening.